the King of Kings. Let, let me read to you 
in a few moments from God's word about Friday. You tell me it was good. But that, that's a that's a good as a as a um, boy. That's a word that can be subject to some strange interpretations, can it? What's good for you might not be good for me. Uh, good um, probably comes in second to best. That was good, so we're going to give you 89%. But the student next to you was best. She got 98. So good can be a measure of what place you fall in. <coughs> ha. See, it depends on who you talk to that defines good. A fisherman will have a good day when he gets a good catch. It might have been a great day on the water. It might have been oily smooth. The wind was soft from the southwest. It wasn't that hot, but it was miserable. It might have been all that. But if you had a dry, if you had a water hole, we call them the, on the East Coast, and you're all back in it, and all you get is water, and there's no fish, it's not a good day. So for a fisherman, a good day is a day when he got the big one. Talk to a farmer, and a good day for harvesting is about taking in an abundant crop that day. The weather was fair, and he <coughs> comes to Talk to a merchant, and he'll say a good day is when the sales were brisk. And I made a good profit. Talk to a golfer, And he had the best score of his life and a hole in one to go with it. That's a good day. That's a good day. That's a good day. And, and if you'll notice what I just said there in all of those few illustrations, good is always defined in the positive. Good is always defined in the positive. Like I said, all of that, this is Good Friday. Let me read to you a Good Friday. Go to Matthew chapter 27. Go to Matthew chapter 27, please. Just, just five verses there. <coughs> Beginning at verse 31, skipping to 35, then 45, 46, and 50. Matthew, this is Good Friday, folks. Matthew 27. Keep in mind, huh? This is Good Friday. And I just, defi I just define good as always being associated with the positive. Matthew 27, verse 31. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. This is the Friday. Verse 35. And they crucified him. Part of his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments amongst them, and on my vesture did they cast lots. This is Good Friday. First we have the intent, then we have the act. Come down to 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried, the 46th verse, and with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? This is Good Friday. Always defined by the positive. In verse 50, Jesus, when he had cried again, with a loud voice, died. This is Good Friday. Emphasis on good. We call this Good Friday. Have you ever thought about what that phrase means on Friday? Good Friday. 
It, it should lend to great victory. It should lend to great celebration. It should lend to <coughs> some incredible positive things. But let me talk to you about the Christ. See, the raw facts of the Word of God does not support that definition of good that I gave you a few moments ago. Want a little insight into what happened that day on Good Friday? It was preceded by and filled with betrayal. Jesus, Jesus had been betrayed by Judas the evening before Good Friday. It was filled with denial. Peter had denied him three times. By his Good Friday. It was filled with abandonment. All of the disciples fled when Jesus was arrested in the garden in preparation for Good Friday. There was a travesty of justice called the Court of the Sanhedrin. <coughs> a mock trial took place on Good Friday. Fear. Hearts were filled with fear. Hearts were filled with agony on Good Friday. There was, there was mob savagery as the crowd said, crucify him, crucify him. There was the most atrocious exchange of prisoners that the world has ever seen when Barabbas was set free and Jesus was crucified on Good Friday. There were insults early at Texas. There was abuse piled on him on Good Friday. On that one day, and in, in the life of Jesus, there were no miracles. On Good Friday. He didn't raise the dead, he didn't heal the sick, he didn't feed the multitudes. There were no miracles. There was no last minute Superman rescue. You notice that, people? When Jesus hung on the cross that day, just before he was about to die, Superman never came down. And wound up all the Pharisees and the Roman soldiers in his web and let Jesus free. Now that's what I call good Friday. He had that last moment, right? He just let him down. He was to die. Superman showed up and spun his whip. Spider-Man. <laughs> That's his twin brother, right, Jordan? No Superman. No Spider-Man. No last minute rescue. No Hollywood finish. No John Wayne stepping into the scene with his six shooters. None of that. Now, that's how I would have defined Good Friday. This, this incredible rescue. Hmm? It was none of that. Want I read the last verse? And that's what they read to you. And Jesus gave up the ghost. All of that before 3 o'clock. We're only to 3 o'clock now. And we've already seen all of that in this day called the Friday. Now, head to this hopelessness. 
unbelief. Nowhere did any of Jesus' followers demonstrate that they believed he would rise again in spite of all that he had told them. You ever notice that? Nowhere does any of the four writing apostles um, depict the disciples together, say, on, 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 on Friday night and Saturday, saying, Wife, we can't figure this all out, but he's coming back. You watch it. He said three days, right? He said three days, and he'll be back tomorrow morning. Nowhere is recorded because nowhere was it stated by the disciples. In fact, to add injury, to, to insult to injury, the only, the vile and heathen may have been the only one to remember Jesus' words. Come with me for a second to, to Matthew 27, 62 and 63. None of the disciples are saying, well, we don't know how this is going to unfold, guys, but he said he's coming, he said he's going to rise again, he said he's going to die free, he's coming back, he's coming back. Listen, let's get ready, because he's coming back. No way. In fact, the only words that we remember were the enemy words. Remembering what Jesus said. Look at, look at, look at Matthew chapter 27, 62, 63. Now the next day, that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together from the pilot. Listen to their message. Saying, sir, we remember that that this deceiver said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. It wasn't the words of his friends, it wasn't the words of the ones that he had demonstrated his power to all through his earthly ministry. It was from the heathen vile that had put him to death. Think. you call that having a good day? Would you call that having a good day? Of course, we would say absolutely not. I'm just sure speaking from the perspective of evil. It appears that, that, that all of what I've said so far was a good day for evil. A good day for you. But you see, here's the eternal but. This is the greatest day of contrast in the history of man. <clears throat> From Haddam onto this day, Friday, April the 2nd, 2010. This day that Jesus died, this Good Friday, is the greatest day of contrast in the history of humanity. Remember my question when I began this short presentation this morning? My question was, what makes a good day? What makes a good day? And if I have 400 people here this morning and ask 200 of you, I'd have 200 different answers. But what makes this day a good day? From the perspective of evil, it looks like good lost and evil won. It looks like the devil won and God lost. That's what it looks like on the bare facts of the day. But let's understand something. We need to understand what constitutes, what constitutes a good day. And let's pick it up for a few moments, please. In, in Isaiah chapter 53, just going to take you for a few moments to, to several texts in Scripture that, want, that, will, that, will, that will validate this perspective that I've shared with you this morning. In, in, in Isaiah chapter 53, let's get the big picture. What we've done, we took one day in history and we looked at all the horrible things that happened that day. We look at, at, the, at the incredible uh, drama that was unfolding that created all kinds of scenarios that I've touched on for a few moments this morning. But let's put it in its context. In Isaiah chapter 53, there are three or four verses I want to share with you. Let's just read, read three, four, five, ten, and eleven. Isaiah is prophesying of one who would come. And he writes this, He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows, 
a queen of the Greeks. And we did, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was dis despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our grief, carried our sorrow, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his strife we are healed. Number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, that he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of the soul, he shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. The beginning of another story. The beginning of another story. What makes a good day? The first element here is the fulfillment of prophetic scripture that was given 800 years before Jesus came. That one would come who would be despised and neglected and put to death. But in that putting to death, God had a purpose. That's what makes good finally good. God had a purpose laid out and it was the beginning of the fulfillment of that purpose. Now quickly come with me over to, to the book of John. John chapter 19. John chapter 19. We're watching this, we're watching this horrible Friday turn into a good Friday. We're, we're watching the events of the, 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 the this, this Friday that we defined a few moments ago turn into something that's astounding and amazing. And, and I'm going to walk with you through it for a few moments. In the 19th chapter of the book of John, and in, in verse 30. The Bible is giving a, a picture of the death of Christ. And in the 30th verse it says, When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, It is finished. He bowed His head and He died. Notice the little word it. It didn't say I. There's a T after the I. <coughs> If there was no T after the I, and if he had cried, I am finished, we would not be here today. We would not have a relationship with Almighty God. We would not be set free from our sins. We would have a certain fear of being lost, and we would be. We have no relation whatsoever. He said, it is finished. What was finished? What was the, when Jesus said, it is finished, he didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. What did he mean by it? Fully understand that one. We need to go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51. Some of you don't even need to go there. Matthew chapter 27, verse 51. This still it says. And let's, let's begin with the 50th verse. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake and the, rent, the rocks rent. What was that all about? It was about this simple truth, but yet the eternal, profound, greatest truth in the Word of God. It is that our redemption was purchased on good Friday. Amen. Our redemption was purchased. When he said, it is finished, he talked about the plan of redemption being accomplished. Amen. Being accomplished in the, in the heart of God, being accomplished in time, and being accomplished for all humanity. That plan to bring men back in reconciliation with God. You see, the, the, the veil of the temple was, was a massive structure. It took, some said, four or six yoke of oxen to even open it up. And, and, and the veil was, 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 was set to separate the, the ark, which was the, the literal, which was the symbolic presence of God and the literal presence of God, from the people. And, and only once a year with blood could the high priest go in there and make sacrifice and atone for the sins of men. And that stood throughout that economy of the law as the, as the separation point between man and God. Man in his sinful state could not come into the presence of Almighty God. A priest would go in to represent him. But God had another plan. And that plan was that the high priest, Jesus Christ, would give his life. And that's exactly what he did. He went in and when he died on the cross, notice something. The veil was written too from the top to the bottom. 
It wasn't man accomplishing anything and reaching up to God. It was God upon the sacrifice of His Son Jesus opening the veil. It says, now because the, the blood of my Son shed, man can come to me. We don't need another intermediary. We don't need an earthly priest. We don't need an earthly leader. Jesus Christ has given His life blood and now there's access. Amen. That's why Good Friday is good. Amen. It accomplished the purpose of God. It accomplished the purpose of God. It's Good Friday. God's redemption plan was accomplished. The veil was written to you and I had access. How many of them? How many prayed this morning before you came to church? Let me see your hand. Look at this. You never had to call me. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? You never had to come to this church for something. Isn't that wonderful? How did that happen? How many believe this morning when you prayed that God heard you? Christ, How did that happen? It happened because of Good Friday. It happened because the way was made. It happened because Jesus is interceding for us at the right hand of the Father. It happened because no matter where I am, at any time, in any place, I have access through the shed blood of Calvary. It happened because Jesus said, It is finished. It happened because the veil was rent in two. This time, it was not just a wooden veil. It was the veil of his physical flesh. Broken and torn. And his blood poured out. And the father said, I am satisfied with the offering. And he pulled that wooden veil apart to stand in eternal rift as a definition of God coming down and men having access to God. Paul would go on and talk about the ramifications and the, and the symbolisms and the truths of these things in Hebrews and, and all of his writing, but putting it all together this morning, he, 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 he opened up an access to his blood on Good Friday. Did you have a good day? You would say, yes. I would say, well, why, why did you have a good day? I mean, something oh, like, did you have a good day? Yeah, sure did. Hey, what happened? Well, I finished the task. The challenge that I had set for myself three weeks ago, I finished it today. I had a good day, but it was something. The outstanding work order that was on my desk that's been there for five days, I finished it today. I'm going to go home with the knees of mine. It's done. We could interview Jesus this morning. So Jesus, we see the brutal treatment you had. We see the, the mocking denial. We see the abuse you took. We see the, the, the disciples who love you abandoning you. We see them filled with fear. We see them completely in amnesia when it comes to remembering the incredible promise that your God rise again. Jesus, are you having a good day? He'd say, yes. I'm having a good day. Why are you having a good day, Jesus? I paid the price. <laughs> Today, I paid off the mortgage on the souls of the men and women that are alive. And now they are free. You're out from under the debt of sin by believing on my name. I paid the price. I laid down my life on good faith. I reconciled. I made salvation available. I made eternal life available. I made redemption available. It is now accomplished for all who will believe. <coughs> Jesus, we saw you being ill-treated, mistreated by friend and foe alike. And now you're telling us that you had a good day. Yes. I had a good day. I accomplished the will of my Father. And you are free. If you would dare, 
believe on my name. This is Good Friday because they're working on it. And for some of it's coming. I said, It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betrayed. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilified. They don't even know that Sunday is coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like Sheep without a shepherd. Mary is crying. Peter is denied. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. Mm. It's right. The Romans beat by Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's right. See Jesus walking the cow, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirits burning. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's come. It's right. The world's win. People are sin. And evil's grin. It's right. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminal. It's right. But let me tell you something. Sunday Sunday. It's right. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross. He ain't forsaken by his father. Left alone and done. Can nobody see you? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has come, and Satan just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is there. A soldier stands guard. And a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a cup.